Welcome everyone to another episode of the Analytic Mind podcast. I'm joined by Mark Stoos uh, today from uh, Proof Analytics, CEO of Proof Analytics. Uh, I have a very good feeling this is going to be an incredibly insightful uh, podcast. Um, there's so much great uh, stuff that Mark's done in his uh, past and uh, with with all of his experience and also what he's doing now. It's just super interesting, particularly around the 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 analytics, the the real the 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 really specific analytics that you can uh, create within a business uh, and the and the returns you can get on that investment. So I'm really looking forward to to diving into that, Mark. Um, why don't I just throw you? Uh, you obviously can do a much better um, job of giving a bit more background about uh, about yourself, and uh, then we can just kick kick off our conversation from there. Sure. Um, so great to be here. And uh, so my name is Mark Stoos, and I am a former large company CCO and CMO, now software analytics software CEO. Um, and the kind of the long and the short of the of my journey into analytics was that about 16 or 17 years ago, um, I was in a pretty senior role at HP and, and I was, um, my colleagues and I were constantly being cut. Our budgets were being cut. And, uh, and I was like, this is bullshit, right? I mean, you know, um, and so I kind of went on this quest to, instead of cursing the darkness, I was, I wanted to strike a match. Mm -hmm. um, and I was not particularly mathematically inclined in school. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so this was really kind of starting from scratch for me. I mean, I'll, I'll never forget the day I actually heard the words multivariable regression. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and I kind of, got hooked on it, like not just professionally, but personally, you know, um, you know, I do, I do mathematical problems today to relax, which is so not what my math teachers in, in high school would have ever dreamed. Right. Um, yeah. so, uh, so I, you know, and I, I have been down the long and arduous road today. I am really more of a connoisseur of, of using analytics in, uh, in making decisions, business decisions, particularly in marketing, but, but certainly today more broadly. Um, and I've seen how challenging it is to operationalize analytics. Mm -hmm. Um, the whole issue of latency, uh, I mean, there's a bunch of issues that kind of converge both technically and culturally within data science that have contributed to this. And so I just, after, you know, my last big role was, uh, I was CMO of Honeywell Aerospace and um, was very successful with an analytics program there, but it was it cost a bloody fortune, right? And it seemed to me to be very logical that the next step would be uh, incorporating automation into mm. the certain parts of the process. Mm. And so that's where we are today with proof. Yeah. So some of that resonates with me because pretty much everyone I'm associated with, uh, with, with my own company enterprise DNA, we, I mean, we all, we all do, um, we all do data analysis on the weekends and in, in our spare time. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a real sort of, uh, love for it. Um, and you know, it sounds, sounds very similar to the, to the journey that you've, um, that, that, you know, that, that you live that day to day. Well, yeah, I mean, I'll even go so far as to say this, I think that, that math and analytics can make you a better person, right? Um, there's a lot of objective truth, um, in math and, and particularly as it is applied to the world. And, you know, we think of that as being physics most of the time. Right. Um, but it's a, you know, when, when all of a sudden you're running models and you realize that what you're doing or what your team is doing is maybe a third of what's important mm -hmm. and that the rest of what's really important, you have no control over at all. Mm -hmm. That's when you start to really, if you have a narcissistic bone in your body, right. Mm -hmm. You, you, your, your starts think, rethink that. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, there's no doubt that, um, 
if you if you've got that data and analytics uh, lean, um, you can make a serious impact to organizations these days. Yeah, and more so now than has ever been before. Um, and that's uh, to do with a variety of trends, you know, all, all, all converging. And I think that's a, a good segue into, you know, maybe the specifics around what you do with proof currently. Um, obviously, you know, you've got a lot of varied background, but now you're really focused with proof on, you know, a specific segment of analytics, really. Um, analytics, uh, maybe, maybe 10 years ago, um, was uh, you know a, a much smaller ecosystem, but now it's it's starting to break off and segment into all of these niche um, analytics uh, you know segments basically. And so right. you're to, to me, it's you're operating in, in in one of those, which is very you know has a very high impact. And so keen to dig a little bit deeper into into how that works and and how um, and, and exactly what you know what you do with proof. Sure. So I think that the, the key to, to proof is this whole idea of operationalizing analytics and that still to this day, right, um, most data scientists would say that 80 to 85% of the world's questions are answered with multivariable regression in some form, right? Mm -hmm. And that also for all of the wonder and majesty of big data and big data solutions, which I, that's the way I prefer to talk about AI because AI is kind of an amorphous idea for a lot of people. Um, but big data solutions, there's just, the, the, I think that one of the challenges for business leaders is that they have a lot of data, but very little of it is big. Hmm. Um, Furthermore, most of the questions that they have about business, about how they can make better decisions, are not big data questions. Mm -hmm. They're actually lean data questions um, using various forms of multivariable analysis, right? And so, um, so we kind of started there, mm -hmm. and then we said, okay, you know. Then we come to decision-making speed, right? The OODA loop, right? The, you know, for those of you who aren't familiar with the OODA loop, it was something that was created as a framework for decision-making by the U.S. Air Force, um, mainly after fighter aircraft started going supersonic and the decisions that had to be made by pilots were happening at, a closing speed of, you know, combat of Mach 4, right? And so they're, they're just, they had to pay more attention. You couldn't, you couldn't fly by the seat of your pants anymore. There wasn't any such thing as a natural pilot anymore. And everyone started really focusing on instruments rather than how they felt about it at any given time. So the OODA loop is the speed with which you observe you orient, you decide, and you act. And in business, that is really defined by the analytics being able to be maintained at a, at a latency equivalent to the clock speed of the business, right? So every business is moving at a certain clock speed. And one of the easiest ways to figure out what that clock speed is is to look at the frequency with which things are commonly measured, right? So if data is being collected, generally speaking, on a weekly basis, the clock speed of the business is probably going to be in that zone, right? If you look at aerospace as an industry, the clock speed is much slower. So most things are, are you know, the, the, the scores, the measurement, the data generally tends to be reported out in monthly it's collected more frequently, right. But it's aggregated and reported on a monthly basis. Right. So that's, that's kind of an easy way back of the napkin sort of way to determine the clock speed of the business. Cause that happens very naturally and intuitively on the part of leaders in a business. Mm. So, um, so we were kind of sitting there saying, okay, 
So if we look at analytics, data science today, the teams are culturally incompatible with business teams. So the data scientists tend to be a cult of precision. And if, if business leaders are a cult, it's a cult of pragmatism and the two clash, right? And one of the thing, one of the, there's a number of ways that they clash the whole issue of precision, the, the business leaders are saying, Hey, you know what? I, I don't really need, I don't care about 95% confidence scores. If you were to model my decisions on a regular basis, that'd be in the twenties and thirties. So if you can double that, man, I'm psyched. I'm just totally enthused about this. Mm -hmm. Also, I need it like a lot faster than you're giving it to me. Mm -hmm. So for example, in the marketing space, right? Um, uh, Procter and Gamble about 30, 35 years ago created marketing mixed modeling, which is essentially, um, econometric analysis applied to marketing, right? Mm -hmm. And they used large mega models that were recomputed at best every six months, usually every 12 months. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was, the results were aging out, um, invisibly. Uh, in between the recalcs and when they would get the forecasts handed to them, even the forecasts were oftentimes in the past by the time the marketers saw it. So I, uh, I think that, that they were, um, the latency thing has really been a killer, mm -hmm. right? It, it, it has frustrated more business leaders than you can possibly imagine. Mm. And so there was just this big opportunity to say, okay, you know what? We are going to maintain um, appropriate levels of accuracy for what business leaders need, mm. acknowledging the fact that most of what we're evaluating in these models is human behavior. So 95% is actually a fiction in mm. that, in that area. You could get to 95%, but that usually means you've overfit the model rather dramatically, right? So actually the 95% in the, in business analytics, it, it represents the introduction of mathematical bias, if anything, into a model. Mm -hmm. So we were, we were approaching it very organically and very pragmatically without detaching from data science principles, right? So. The math in proof is right down the middle of the fairway, multivariable regression, right? Mm -hmm. You can't get any less sexy than this math, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it also has had all of the imperfections beaten out of it by tens of thousands of data scientists over multiple generations, right? So it is highly reliable and thus uh, much more uh, amenable to automation. Mm. It's not mm. fragile, you mm. know. Mm. Um, you start to automate something that's very fragile, and you can have a problem. And and this is very this has the right amount of robustness to it that can handle automation. Mm. So. But what it also means is that instead of mega models, you know, you're doing minimum viable models, right? So this is straight out of agile methodology, right? You're working directly with the business leaders and you're saying, does this model answer your question around this specific thing, right? And they, you go back and forth several times and they're like, okay, that really works for me. And then you put it in production. And then you hook it up to APIs, to auto data flows, and, and then you're off to the races and it becomes essentially an autonomous recalc. So in proof, every time that new data is presented to a model, it recalcs. Mm. So what we discovered about four years ago was, uh, and I'll, I'll stop here, um, is when you do that, these models behave exactly like a GPS. 
And that was important because if you think about the average business question, it's really an optimization and re-optimization question in the context of shifting environments, right? Hmm. So it's a navigation question, really, right? Do I, based on what's happening out there in the marketplace, what do I need to change? When do I need to change it? And how much do I need to change it by, right? So pretty much exactly like a GPS. And so that's, that's where we are today. Um, we're on both AWS and Salesforce as platforms. That is just, my, my mind sort of whirling a little bit because there's so many little things that you touched on that are so fascinating. And I love what, one of the, one of the things I love the most about just the way that you, you're, you, you sort of explain things there. It's like you really dive deep into, uh, the nuts and bolts of getting a data solution that will, um, showcase a salt like you can measure and will showcase a strong ROI um you know with with like tangible data you know that 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 that's one one aspect I really like one of the things I want to revert back to I just noted it down um was Procter and Gamble how you mentioned that I my my father once upon a time worked for PNG when they were expanding into Asia about I was I was uh, five so I was it's like 35 years ago so it was probably around that time. And one of the insights he, I mean, he, he still raves about them even now. Um, and he said it was the best learning experience because they were the ones that, that really figured out what marketing could actually do uh, in terms of, you know, boosting your growth globally. And they, I think one of the, he, he met, one sort of thing he mentioned is they figured out what mass marketing on TV could do. Like that's one of the, the, the real insights that they had before anyone else. And so they they sort of won with analytics 35, 35 oh, 40 years ago right they yeah. they figured it they figured it out and then just doubled down and just started globally uh, spending you know i mean the reality is i'm sure there was lots of other similar products at the time but they realized that one thing um through data through that model so that modeling that you uh, that you uh, mentioned um and you know just went for it just they they knew that they were going to get the, the the return and they just went boom it's just it's sort of like yeah, the equivalent of spending one dollar and getting two dollars back. Like they they kind of figured that out and were able to obviously operationalize it. Yeah, no, actually, yeah, this is a great example because even though their analytics were slow, their analytics were faster than anybody else's. Yeah. Right. And so that numerator denominator relationship really worked for them. Hmm. You know, and one of the things that we see over and over again in all kinds of applications is that if your OODA loop is faster than everybody else's, you win. Yep. Right. Um, and so it, it's just, uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I, P and G I've read, I think everything that's ever been published about what P and G did there, mm -hmm. just because it's such a phenomenal case study, because they not only broke that ground, mm -hmm. they were absolutely first, um, but they also took it all the way to a high degree of maturity. I mean, today, uh, they're still doing it. I mean, then they have yeah. um, levels of sophistication that I can probably only dream about. Yeah, it's essentially though that their their sort of moat around that has somewhat not not totally because i think that there is there is such a competitive advantage in their um exit you know the spend that they can over anyone but it's sort of has been eaten away a little bit through the new forms of marketing that you can do right and that's kind of more sort of what you guys are are trying to um, quantify uh with your with with, with proof from if, if i'm if i'm not mistaken is that you're trying to quantify okay well there's uh, this much audience. This is how you can reach them through all of these different marketing sort of channels. Um, this is how you can evaluate if the spend is worth it. Is it, is it with, is that kind of, kind of along the, the, the right lines? Well, no, actually the way I would, I mean, cause there's a lot of that data is certainly collected and it's used by customers to model things in proof, but mm -hmm. we are really, I mean, proof is used, I mean, simplistically it is cause and effect analysis, right? 
It is, hey, I, I have this dependent variable, this outcome that I'm really seeking to produce uh, in this population, in this audience, right? And I'm doing these 20 things. And each one of those 20 things has its own time lag. It has its own efficacy, right? In that amount of time. Mm -hmm. And so I need to understand all the classic stuff, right? I need to understand how each one contributes, right? I need to know how they start to combine to create cumulative effects. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that can also sometimes be, you know, other than what's desired, uh, that can be bad in quotes. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's a, there's a, all that normal stuff that has always been produced by multivariable regression. Right. Um, but we're just doing it at high speed or at the relevant speed for the business. Right. Um, so like, I mean, if, if you're a retail customer and your data is materially altering hour by hour, and so you're, you care about the relationships, the cause and effect relationships on that frequency level, you can get it in proof. You can do that. Um, so it, it, uh, it also allows you to scale. So you can have, instead of spending millions of dollars on two models, right? You can, you can say, you know what, I need a hundred models. Um, you, we also spent a lot of time on the UX, particularly for the business user, because what we started really seeing was is that if you just kind of dumb down the analyst screens for the business user, that doesn't work psychologically. I mean, there's several reasons, but one of them is that a surprising number of business users get psyched out by a graph. Like as strange as that sounds, right? There's actually a lot of research on it. Mm. And so that doesn't really apply to a chart, but a graph, they'll just kind of shut down. And these are really smart people. These are not stupid people, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, we had to figure out some new visualization approaches that would make, make it, that would break through that barrier and, and help them very rapidly and intuitively understand what they need to do next. Because the key thing here is that most of these decisions, um, repeat with some frequency, right? So it really is a optimization, re-optimization kind of scenario here on most of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And if you can, I mean, just to kind of use this as an illustration, if you improve one decision, 1% every day for a year, the compound value of that at the end of the year is almost 4,000%. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's non-trivial. So, I mean, you, you, the, the individual hurdle is not huge here. You just need to make it really clear to the business user at whatever frequency matters to them in that situation, what they need to do next, how they make a better decision. So that's really, that's the essence of it right there. One of the, one of the things I, I, I know, even just, just from personal experience around marketing, and maybe you can shed some light on, on this a little bit, is that you always have so many options in front of you that you could choose from a marketing perspective, you know, and as a, you know, a general business, you know, I'm not talking about large ones with lots of resources here. It's hard to know where to focus your efforts, whether it's uh, time or whether it's, whether it's investment, you know, first you've got to sort of select the channel, then you've got to work out, well, is it going to get the returns that I desire? You know, what, what are some of the things that you can recommend to think about to, you know, before you even build a model or, or, or get some sort of output, like what are some of the things that you think are important at even that stage to, you know, almost build your marketing universe, like what, what you should focus on, you know, even, even at that point. 
Well, as a, I'll tell you this as a former CMO, right? Um, and I guess you never really turn that off completely. Um, you know, it's a, it's always an outside in approach, right? I mean, you end up inside yourself. You don't start there. And too many companies start with their own perspective and try to push that out into the marketplace <laughs> instead of saying, okay, what are we really, what do our customers really want? What do they really need? Um, how do they want to be reached? What are they hungry for? Mm -hmm. And meeting them there. Right. Yeah. So I tend to say at the beginning, right. You're, 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 you're highly experimental. So one of the things I love about the minimum viable model kind of approach is that allows you to be very experimental, um, and do so very quickly without investing huge amounts of resources. Um, and you can start to say, okay, you know what? These, these things are really super important and other things are clearly not, I think, but that may change over a period of time. And um, I'm just gonna keep modeling because this whole thing is not static. I mean, one of the things we've really seen over the last, say, three years, starting with COVID, is that if you look at model performance on different questions in 2019, 2020, 2021, and now 2022, the lack of commonality is striking. So past is not prologue at all. And so if you kind of really understand that and really say, you know what, no matter what the truth is today, it may not be that way tomorrow or next week or next month or next year. And so this is where actually the analytics, particularly performed on a low latency basis, really matter, like mm -hmm. a lot, mm -hmm. is being able to keep up with the changes. It, can, can you give us a, like a, a specific example? Um, so like a, a real world example of what, um, you can, uh, f the, 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 uh, I guess, I guess the, the inputs that you could put into say proof and then what, what model, um, output you will get, uh, from, from a question or from a range of questions you might, might want to ask. Yeah. I mean, so basically we start with what, what are the key decisions you need to make, right? What are you faced with? What do you already know you have to be better at? Mm -hmm. Those usually are expressed at some level as questions. The question tends to suggest a model, right? And the model tends to suggest the data that's necessary to arm the model. So I'm kind of operating at 30,000 feet here, right? But let's just say that you are wanting to build a model that says, what is the impact of my brand investment, which is kind of notoriously to a lot of people soft, but actually really isn't. They just, the time lag issue really interferes with people's ability to quote, see it. Right. When you, when you, when you say, when you say brand, it's, it feels kind of vague. It's not, but, but I know. It's, yeah, so, so, so brand is actually nothing more and nothing less than the distillation in the, in the mind of the customer of awareness, confidence, and trust. That's it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and these are, these factors are highly related to things like more deals. This would be awareness. So this is kind of top of the funnel. Middle of the funnel would be bigger deals. So this is where deal expansion takes place. And that's highly related. And note, I'm not using the word correlated. I'm just saying highly related to, um, uh, to confidence scores. So confidence is, I believe I, that you can do what you say you can do. And I believe it so much that I'm actually thinking about buying more from you than I was originally intending to. Um, and trust is something that happens. It's kind of the dark night of the soul for every buyer, right? 
Um, it happens at the bottom of the funnel and it's highly related to the speed of decision making. So if I really trust you, all of the things being equal, I'm going to go, oh man, let's just go for it. Right. If I have real concerns, I'm going to slow down and I'm going to do more due diligence and I'm, I'm going to prove it out more and all this kind of stuff. Right. So, and in really super easy way, just real fast to, to just differentiate in the mind of your audience about confidence and trust is that we all have worked with people in our career that were awesome at what they did, but you didn't trust them at all. Mm -hmm. Right. And we also have known a few people in our career that were just amazing human beings. We totally trusted them, but they were borderline incompetent at their jobs, right? Mm -hmm. That's the difference between confidence and trust. Mm -hmm. So you are saying, okay, I want to understand what in my brand investments, how that's impacting uh, deal velocity, right? So deal velocity is your dependent variable, all these different investments that you're making in brand, and maybe you throw in some demand investments as well, just to kind of shake things up a little bit. And you want to say, okay, what's the, how long is it taking for all of these investments to have a, an understandable, recognizable impact on deal velocity mm -hmm. and how much of an impact and relative to things that I don't control, like competitor issues, macro environment, interest rates, whatever happens to be important in your industry. Mm -hmm. um, are we doing enough to overcome any headwinds and tailwinds that might be presenting to what we do, right? How are we dealing with that and still maintaining efficacy and impact on deal velocity, right? This is now a, a, this is a swirling kind of calculation, right? Because if all of a sudden a major customer or excuse me, a major competitor does something really important, for example, and really gets a lot of awareness and a lot of confidence building up, that's going to change the efficacy and impact of what you're doing. If there's all of a sudden the macro tanks, right? That's going to have a different kind of impact if all of a sudden everything lines up perfectly with you, right? So you've got multiple tailwinds behind all of your investments. Then what do you do there, right? I mean, you were talking about money and opportunity cost and figuring mm -hmm. that out as a small business. Mm -hmm. Do you leave the investment at the same point that you currently have it despite the tailwinds and just go faster? Or do you just slim down your investment, counting on the tailwinds to kind of make up the difference, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of different ways to think about this. And at the end of the day, these are all business decisions because every dollar that you spend here is a dollar you can't spend over here. And also if the dollar you spend over here busts, right? If it doesn't generate the desired return, you're actually a two time loser, right? Because you lost what you spent it on and you lost what you could have spent it on. Right. So mm -hmm. this is all, you know, that's an example and a real world example of that would be Johnson controls. Mm -hmm. So large technology manufacturer, right? Mm -hmm. A very diversified business. Yeah. Um, they're, they started being able to start that. We, we, we have been, uh, we have a small, a uh, small um, relationship with them. Yeah. And so they, uh, they started seeing evidence in the analytics this is just as we're going into COVID in that spring of 2020, that some of their major channels, their major investment areas were sub performing and were, it was, it, and it was. These were things like field marketing. So these would be like customer events, things like that, that historically had been really high performers for them very consistently. And all of a sudden these were just rapidly turning into dogs, right? But nobody could figure out 
why that was. In other words, if you're if you use the pilot analogy, right? They were the pilot and they were looking around and they couldn't see anything wrong mm -hmm. yet, but their instruments were telling them you got bad stuff happening, right? So they decided to listen to their instruments and, and they started pulling the plug on a lot of these uh, event investments um, early before anybody else started doing it. So they were able to save like $6 million doing that and plow that money then into other channels that suddenly were looking far more promising in the COVID era. And so that's a great example of using the analytics to actually save money and make money. Mm. Yeah. So it's really fascinating. Do you feel, um, do you feel like the concept of brand, brand investments becomes more relevant when you're a large company, a super large company? Because when you, when you look at it for anyone who's not at that sort of level, you know, which is, you know, a vast majority of businesses uh, out there, it's so hard to be able to quantify that brand, that brand investment, you know, it, 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 it could be, uh, I mean, you, you could think of it as like impressions. You could think of it as, uh, yeah. And that's data though, right? Yeah, it, it is the only, the only way to really understand it is to put that data in relationship with things you really care about, yeah. like average deal velocity. Right. And so if you are, so like at Honeywell, um, it was generally thought to be all but impossible to substantially improve average deal velocity because it was such a highly regulated environment. Um, we gradually built up to about four and a half percent faster average deal velocity. So we were getting roughly $12 billion moving into Honeywell about 4% faster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That made me and my teams the best friends of finance. Right. They, that, that right there was a home run, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I would say that that is also really true in a very small company. I mean, I'm living it. I mean, proof is a, is a scale up, but I mean, we're still small, right? Mm -hmm. One of the things that, one of the reasons why it's so hard for startups to get traction is that they don't have brand. They don't have extensive awareness, confidence, or trust. Mm -hmm. If they do have confidence and trust, it's usually because their founder was really well known before he founded the company or she founded the company. Mm -hmm. And, and so every, the earliest customers are really making the decision to buy based on his or her brand power, because the company doesn't really have one yet. Right. And so I would say that actually, if you kind of look at the dark light kind of analogy here, when you, when you have nothing, you realize how much you need the light, right? Um, and it's, it's the big companies, those CEOs and the big companies are spoiled in many cases because they've never been dark before. They've never had to drive business with no brand power. If they ever had that experience, they would even without the analytics, but particularly with it, right? They would never go back to, to that belief. <laughs> yeah. Brand is, brand is like this powerful force, um, you know, out there in the universe that just attracts people, um, day after day to your service, your offering, your, 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 your product. Um, yeah. and it's, yeah, it's, it's such an interesting, I mean, I, I'm loving the fact that, um, you know, that. Yeah, you know, if, if before our conversation today, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have thought there's a way to 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 really quantify brand, like really truly quantify it. But um, you've obviously spent obviously spent a lot more time thinking about that than than I have, and uh, and obviously you have experience and and researched it more. And so it's just fascinating to to think a bit more outside the box than 
you know, um, the, the, the sort of day-to-day -day marketing thoughts that, that I personally have and probably what a lot of people have. When I, when I look at my landscape that, that we, you know, that most businesses uh, of, of our size, of, of my size and, um, and even upwards, I mean, you, you really are looking at a, your, your, you know, there's only a few, there's a few opportunities in front of you. There's like Google, there's Facebook, there's content, there's, um, uh, I don't know, there's, there's, uh, like banner advertising, there's the YouTube advertising, there's LinkedIn marketing. So, you know, those are the, those are the, the things that you can really look at. And then, you know, working backwards, how do you, you know, I, I guess like an impression of in, in, on any of those could be quantified as something sort of like helping the brand. Um, but then it's about measuring how much are you spending, you know, through all of those different, uh, segments and, 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 and areas, and then seeing how each of those impressions you get on each different platform work into your brand. I mean, it's, it's quite, it's quite a fascinating mathematical problem, isn't it? It is. Uh, I'll, actually, I'll give you another example. Uh, that's maybe not the one that anybody expects. So we are all aware of the fact that generally speaking, small companies, startups are, particularly in the technology space, are where the innovation is. And that as you get larger and larger and larger and larger, you lose innovation, right? You don't see major innovation typically coming out of the top, top tier of companies. Um, yep. Part of that is, is that they have so much brand and so much market weight and so much inertia that they no longer need the innovation. That would be one way to think about it, right? That they, they, they kind of get lazy would be another way of thinking about it. The incentives um, drop significantly for, for individuals and teams to push innovation because it, you know, you can, right. yeah, you can lose your job over, over a bad innovation or, or something like That's that. That's right. Exactly. And so then what happens is though, is that they are aware of the fact that this is the case. And so they, they know that they need to at least appear that they haven't completely lost it. Right. So what do they do? They reach down and they buy small companies, startups that are highly innovative, right? And this is essentially the ecosystem that exists in tech, right? I mean, little companies like Proof, we are essentially the farm team, right? We are, we are creating the innovation that may or may not uh, yield an exit, right? Yep. Um, and they are doing it because all they have is brand and distribution. So they have, you know, they have like, you know, you pick, pick one, right. They have huge marketing and sales apparatus so they can reach every customer easily and they have huge brand recognition, What they don't have anymore is innovation. And so this is, this is kind of one of the things that you see in the models when you when you model that kind of stuff over time you mm -hmm. see the there's this kind of this arc and things start to inflect and then they kind of go down right and the brand is going up at the same time that the innovation is going down mm. yeah that, and i would say that that's true like 98 percent of the time yeah you know that, that, that that's another that is a really interesting topic i've, I've just, just through um, some relationships, I've got a, a similar feel for that in the finance industry, where uh, a lot of the big financial organizations, big banks, then they they just let the um, small fintech companies fight it out, and then just wait until the you know the the winner emerges, and then that's you know they they don't have to spend any money, don't have to lose any um, of their personal credibility, and then they'll just uh, purchase the purchase the winner and scale scale it with their distribution platform. You know, it's a similar sort of thing, right? That's exactly right. A friend of mine actually went through that very scenario and sold to Goldman Sachs, right? Uh, in, in the fintech space. Mm -hmm. And that was what you just said is exactly what happened. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like the, the startup world is the, the shark invested waters and, um, you know, who, whoever makes it out alive, um, you know, they're the ones that the, the, the bigger <laughs> companies just want to, want to, want to, want to, they just can see, you know, uh, there was, a, there was, I mean, that happened sort of everywhere. It's, it's sort of like, um, 
uh, Figma's, uh, you know, Adobe just bought Figma. I mean, that's a perfect example, right? Like um, they just sort of sat there. Adobe's obviously, got, you know, become huge. I mean, that, they would be considered innovative, but obviously, you know, weren't innovative enough to see um, the emergence of a of an online, you know, platform that that uh, that could that could sort of eat their lunch at some point. So, you know, they they eventually bought it. But that's yeah. Again, well, I, well, actually, yeah. I mean, to, to sort of extend your analog about the shark infested waters, right? Mm -hmm. Investors are always looking for uh, hot startups with a moat, right? Mm -hmm. um, an anti competitor moat, which in your analogy would be a shark cage, yeah, right? That had a motor on it, a self propelled shark cage so that you could swim safely through those waters without tiring yourself out because it was self-propelled itself, you know? So, I mean, that's, that's, you're right. I mean, that's exactly what, that's why people look for that kind of stuff and, and investment opportunities. Well, almost with, 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 with like a, a big brand, when you get to that point, uh, that that becomes your your competitive moat, right? Like, um, I mean, I've, I've read a lot of like what Warren Buffett says, and he always raves about Coke, right? Their, their moat is just, you know, their brand. Um, no one can com ever compete with like, their own. You couldn't even build Coke with, you know, if you if you were given, you know, probably a hundred billion dollars, like you just couldn't do it. Um, it would it would be very very difficult because of the brand that they that they have created, and so that becomes your competitive advantage at some point, doesn't it? And so if we, if we relate, uh, you know, regardless of like what your product is or, or what your distribution model is or your pricing, you know, the brand is your, is, is your moat. So if we were to just relate that back to say, you know, a more moderate business, you know, it, 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 in your experience and maybe within some of the analysis that you have seen, is there a way to build that shark cage? Is there a way to build, build that moat at a slightly earlier stage with the marketing and yeah. uh, marketing opportunity yeah. and impression opportunities that we have yeah. available to us these days without a doubt i mean the, the that so the the answer to that is an unequivocal yes the key is that you have to get really real about what your ideal customer looks like so the icp the ideal customer portrait right which is not the same thing as your addressable market at all. In fact, it's going to be a really super small fraction of the, the TAM, right? Mm -hmm. So when you figure out what that ICP really is, it's usually small enough to where you also know where they hang out. Um, in our case, right, there's several different areas of LinkedIn, several different communities, or groups of people in, in LinkedIn that makes uh, that a very, very robust space for us to communicate with people, right? We share um, our perspectives, we share our innovation, we get into conversations back and forth with people. We don't just post in our own page, right? We go to other people's threads and we are commenting below their, their post and getting in conversations, right? So now we're really, instead of a set piece kind of communications strategy, marketing strategy, this is very dynamic. And one of the reasons why it's so effective is that it builds trust and confidence really fast because people in that dynamic kind of give and take rapidly figure out whether you know what you're really talking about or not. Mm -hmm. where they can really have that confidence and trust in you. Mm -hmm. So those things tend to convert pretty fast and they're very brand enhancing. So I, I, you know, um, there's several people actually that for proof that, that perform that kind of role, I'm certainly one of them, right? Um, I'm probably one of less than five or six. CMOs in the B2B space yep. that can say that I've done what I've done with analytics, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I have a, I have the ability to speak and share about this in a way that very, very few people can. Mm -hmm. And with the 
So again, we're talking about brand power with the Honeywell brand behind me, as well as HP and BMC and others, right? It's pretty hard for people to say, ah, guy, he, you know, who is he, right? So this is now building that personal brand, right? Saying, okay, um, I'm, I'm building it for myself. So every time any of us does a podcast like this, we are representing both ourselves and our own brand, as well as the company that we're speaking for. Mm. And it builds together. And just, just like, did the data tell you that, or have you been able to do that and then quant quantify that it's working with data? How, how, how is that related back to the, um, the, the marketing decision to do that? Yeah. I mean, I, I would say that, that one of the things that's very true is that most marketers have correctly intuited what works. Yeah. They can't prove it. Okay. But they have generally speaking, they're on target. Right. Yep. So I would say that I correctly intuited things that would build my brand and build my company's brand and did those things. And that created data that then I was able to put into a model that not only proved it. Okay. But then gave me the opportunity to, again, using it like a GPS, I could tweak it. Mm -hmm. Right. And I could, if all of a sudden things in the marketplace changed, I could change with it. Right. I could, um, uh, maintain my effectiveness but using different messages or different tools or whatever, right. That were still authentic, right. Okay. But they were different. So I was kind I'm, my goal is to meet people where they are. I don't want them to have to meet me where I am. Mm -hmm. I understand that they are attracted in, in many cases to what I know and what I've experienced. But if I, one of the reasons why I use analogies a lot, right. Is that, we're talking about a very technical topic that for most people, particularly business leaders, it's Greek to them. So you have to be able to put it across to them in a way that connects with them. And so fortunately, there's a lot of analogies out there that are very evocative and they connect readily and it, and they have the added virtue of being really super accurate in terms of their, as in terms of being a, an accurate representation of data science, for example. Right. So, yeah, I mean, that's, I would say that it is a virtuous loop, right? You, you tend to do things first and then you prove it and then you iterate it and you mm -hmm. keep on iterating it for the rest of your life. Yeah, so uh, I was just thinking like you, you, you test hypothesis, try and test some hypothesis quickly, totally. and then that will give you that that feedback of data that you can then 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 put into your model and, and interpret from there. Um, so that, that's what I was sort of thinking when you're when you're explaining that. One of the one of the other things I I, I totally resonate with as well is uh, how you said when you're speaking to managers or or um, business leaders out there. Um, even even today, that uh, the 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 concept of the analytics infrastructure you need uh, to succeed can be like a foreign language to 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 a lot of these um, to to a lot of these leaders. Probably yeah, less than it was a decade ago, but still still um, um, quite prevalent. So, uh, so I'll I'll say this though: one of the things we're seeing right now, this might really interest your audience. Mm -hmm. And they already be experiencing it themselves, right? Is that businesses are under pressure because of the macro. They are turning around and they're saying to their data science teams, wow, you know what? I really need what you've got. The problem is, is, is that in many cases, the data science team has spent millions of dollars over the last five, six, seven years on data management. So they have this incredibly uh, complex plumbing system for data. 
but no good water is coming out the other end of the pipe that the business can drink. And that is, I mean, one of the things we're seeing right now about proof is that they can, they can buy licenses to proof. They can attach proof to the front end of that plumbing system, and they can start generating, you know, cold, clean water for the business almost immediately with these minimum viable models. Mm. Um, and that's kind of a lot for some that's kind of saving their bacon a little bit here because they don't, they have not invested in modeling nearly as much as they should have at the same time that they were investing in the data management. Mm -hmm. And this is a, I mean, this is the CDO topic du jour, right? This is the, this is, um, uh, there's several communities on LinkedIn that obviously are dominated by CDOs and, um, I'm certainly not a data scientist at all, but I, I have acquired a lot of expertise. And so I, I can kind of hang out with them and not get into trouble. And that's, this is what they're talking about right now. Yeah, no, I, I, I love that. I, I also, um, th that brings me to another sort of insight I've had is that, um, sometimes I think managers and business leaders get a bit overwhelmed with the whole analytics topic because there's, there's actually so much that you can do or that you have to bring together or what you think you have to bring together um, to actually make it work, like from data collection, engineering, analysis, so on and so forth. And so I like the, I like the idea of like minimum viable model. Um, it's like bringing those minim, that, that minimal viable product concept you know, to the analytics space. It's, it's not about getting the um, analytics 100% um, correct. Like you can probably, uh, you know, you can probably get the value, get far in excess the value of your investment just by getting you know, a 90% confidence. You know, it doesn't have to be exact, exact. Maybe in, in some specific cases it does. I would but say, I would say it's usually even a lot less. Yeah. Right. The, the, and the, you know, when you're constantly recalcing the models, that is your risk mitigation. And so back in the day, 95% was your risk mitigator, right? But you don't need that nearly as much, particularly in a business context. I mean, if you're talking about life and death, then I, I would have a completely different answer, right? Yeah. yeah. But, uh, if, but if you're talking about business for the most part, that's just not what business leaders need. They don't need the 90% or the 80%. I mean, uh, Dave Cody, who, when I was at Honeywell, he was the chairman and CEO of the parent company hmm. and he was the former global CFO of GE. So this guy was Mr. Analytics yeah. and he heard one time and he was kind of my patron, but he heard one time that I was spending a lot of money trying to climb the confidence score ladder, right? And he got so mad at me for doing that because he's right. like, do you, do you have any idea? He said, I make big decisions based on what would probably be 20 and 30 and 40 confidence score type models, right? If they were mm -hmm. modeling, mm -hmm. I don't need that. I need to know that what I'm doing is reasonably on target. And if you can get me to 50 or 60 so that I can make an even better decision, right? Then I just think you're the greatest thing in the world, but do not spend all this money trying to scale those heights. They don't, the heights don't matter. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was the beginning of a big lesson that I really had to kind of wrap my head around. And it's probably the most controversial thing that you see in these conversations on LinkedIn in these data science communities, mm -hmm. if you are classically trained as a data scientist, that means that you are an academic and you see it academically and you are wedded, you are welded to that high confidence score. But if you try to 
make that happen in a business context, you will end up overfitting every model. Mm. Yeah. And do, do you find like, do, do, do you feel that um, you've decided to focus on, say, the marketing aspect of business because of the, um, you know, is, is it because of the data that, that we have available to us now, the variety of data, the ability to sort of move the needle more within the regular business because of the marketing spend you have these days than, than what it was historically? Is that, is that, is that why you think um, you're focused in? Well, I can, I can just, I mean, yeah, I can just answer it um, this way, right? Uh, marketing is in many large companies is the largest single line item uh, by function. Mm. Um, it in, terms has, of percent, in terms of percent, what, 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 what would be your sort of gauged, uh, your, your approximate of what most companies are spending of their revenue? I think in B2C, it could be as high as 40, 50% in some cases. In B2B, it's probably more like, tw- you know, anywhere from 20 to 25%. Mm-hmm. Um, again, these are really broad statements, right? There's going to be a lot of exceptions on either end of the bell curve, right? But, um, but yeah, I mean, all you have to do, I mean, there is a big reason why when things tighten up for a company, there are two main areas that they go after for immediate budget cuts. And one is marketing and the other is general employee population to so layoffs, right? Mm-hmm. And it's because that's where most of the money is, mm-hmm. right? So there, you know, it, it doesn't do any good. If you, if you're trying to save a hundred million dollars, you know, laying off people who make $25,000 a year is not going to do you much good, right? I mean, you're going to have to lay off a lot of those. Mm-hmm. You're going to go after the, the large pots of money first. And that's what happens here. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I, th- I, a huge amount of money on the line with marketing and the whole go-to-market apparatus, huge amount of money. And it also has the least amount of proof, small p proof, right? Uh, in terms of cause and effect analysis, mm-hmm. they are particularly in B2B marketing, they're, they're very unsophisticated about it. So it was a great opportunity to make a big impact. Um, the other thing is, is that in order to show marketing's impact, on different parts of the business, right? So because like another one other than sales would be recruiting and retention, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You are, you have to have an agnostic analytics platform. So that's exactly what proof is. I mean, even though, even though we have pointed it at the marketing ROI question, right? The reality is that our customers ingest all kinds of functional data and outside data, externalities, right, uh, into proof. And so it, it's an act, you could use proof to run anything that is a multivariable regression, linear or nonlinear analysis. Mm. Do you believe in, um, I don't know, I don't know if it's a well-known um, saying or, 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 or philosophy, but I, I read it once and, and it kind of resonated to me is that if you can, if you can spend more money on marketing and spend it more effectively than your competitors in the end you will win do you believe do you believe is that, is that something that you believe? i i think that if what you're marketing and selling is pretty good quality meets people where they are then yeah. that is absolutely true mm-hmm. so marketing is a non-linear multiplier of sales which is a linear function. It cre- so these are, these are perfectly matched, okay, from the standpoint that they, they're operating, they're creating value asynchronously. One's linear, one's nonlinear. One is very short cycle, that, that would be sales. Marketing plays a much longer ball, right? 
So there's a lot more time lag. Easy way to understand this is if you've ever been in a QBR, you know, like a sales quarterly sales meeting, QSR, you're going to, you're going to see sales present its performance data and you're going to see marketing, uh, do the same. And let's just say it's the second quarter Q2, right? The problem is, is that most people pair those two things and say, well, they're directly related, but they're not right. In fact, the Q2 for marketing and the Q2 for sales have almost nothing in common. Time lag alone ensures that, right? Mm -hmm. So Q2 sales numbers were impacted probably by the previous Q4, maybe even the previous Q3. Mm -hmm. And it's taken that long for whatever was done back there to have an impact, right? Mm -hmm. That is... That's where people, like, if there's one thing that I say to business people, to marketers that makes the light bulb go ding above their head, it's that. Mm. So they know that time lag exists, although they don't know the technical term time lag. They just says, well, marketing takes a while to get going and have an impact, right? Mm -hmm. And you're like, yeah, that's true. But do you know that it's actually, you can calculate the time lag and that if you don't know the time lag into the future, you will never find the value in the calendar. You won't know where to look. Right. Yeah. So that is a, that, that is a great example of where analytics brings remarkable clarity to something that is utterly unclear for most people. Yeah, I mean, I, I would, I would presume that the vast, vast majority are doing marketing on intuition, even, even today. It's all, it's all just in, intuition. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I would even put myself in that category. I mean, it's, it's. So, I, I'm yeah. trying to quantify. I'm trying to quantify as much as I can, but a lot of it is just okay. Our sales are, 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 are growing month on month. So something's working in the mix here. The impression we're getting more impressions every month. So some something is aligning here. You know, the, the, there's no quantifying from 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 our end. And I, I, my guess is the vast majority. So you know, any way that you can put that into a model and somehow quantify. I mean that 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 you know that confidence level can um, you know could be that 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 multiplier a, a faster that exponential multiplier. On uh, uh, on your on your review, something something that you know is absolutely fascinating that that we need to. Yeah, well, you, know, you know, I mean, it, it, one of the things that's really cool about that uh, statement is that intuition, human intuition, you're not born with it, right? You acquire it across time based on your experience. The experiences you have are the training data for your internal model. So this is really intuition is pattern recognition. It's machine learning. It's your own personal, private machine learning, right? The problem is, is that just like machine learning, it's totally, it's validity, it's accuracy, is totally rooted in the quality of the training data. Mm. And so for marketers who are operating based upon their intuition and experience, in an environment that it has changed radically from and differs radically from most of their experience, right? Operating intuitively doesn't really work because mm -hmm. the patterns are broken, right? Mm -hmm. New patterns are being created, maybe, right? So that is that you put your finger on it when you said that because if you are operating intuitively right now, where past is not prologue, you are screwed. Yeah, look, I, I, I would, I would, um, I, I know I'm talking a lot from personal experience here, but I, I think that it, it is, it is relevant. Is that getting to a, a higher confidence from, from, from my perspective in, in our marketing spend, uh, is something that. If we do it right, you know, I, I think that, it, that could be the, 
the significant move, uh, needle mover in our business. Because at the moment, your sales fluctuate sometimes month to month and you're wondering, oh, is the spend that I spent, you know, for the last, the cumulative spend over the last six months, has it faltered? Is it, is it, is it slowly uh, not working? You know, but you can't really, when you're just dealing with intuition, that's very difficult to ascertain. Like it's very, very, very difficult to know. Um, and then you start second guessing yourself and becoming overwhelmed with uh, lots of decisions. So, you know, really that's just a personal anecdote of, 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 um, you know, what you're, you know, what, what you're trying to solve, right. Is, 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 is actually, you know, bringing much more, um, uh, confidence in that, in that decision. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Mark, I think, I think, um, we could, we might, we might round it off cause I know we've gone over time. So I don't want to, don't want to take out uh, any more of your time, but from my perspective, uh, I loved the, uh, the, the depths we, we dove into some specific analytics topics there. I mean, it's, um, quite unique to, to some of the content we've had historically. So, um, really glad we could get your, ex your yourself and your experience, um, onto, onto the podcast. So, so thank you very much for, for joining me today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And um, just just for our listeners, if they want to um, reach out or or, or um, learn a little bit more about Proof and, and 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 yourself, where are the best channels to to do that? So I would say LinkedIn is by far the best. Um, mm -hmm. You can either send me a private message, or I'm totally okay with you like jumping into a thread or something like that and saying, "Hey, Mark, I'd like to talk to you." Right, um, and then we can take it offline in, in whatever way works for you. Um, I'm also on Twitter, so you can DM me on Twitter. You, you know, again, you can go public with it too. It's, it's up to you. Um, email is probably the worst. If you want to know, if you want to find out more about proof, I would say go to our website. It's proofanalytics.ai and it will tell you a lot. And then I'm always happy to, to talk. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Mark. Really, really appreciate it. Loved, loved the discussion. Um, thanks everyone for for tuning in, and uh, don't forget to subscribe to the Analytic Minds on uh, all your um, relevant uh, listening channels for for podcasts. Okay, let's round off. Thanks. Uh, thanks everyone.